I did, the cowboy boots, I, I deny this. I, 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 I don't know what that was about, but. Um, oh, also, uh, uh, let's see, where's Michelle? So, because there's a space right here. Um, so, okay. Um, so, I, I, first of all, I am very happy to be here. I actually, I think this is the first time I've actually been here when it's official and it's actually IDSS. Although, I'd like to put in a, a plug. The Entity is a way better name, and I'm sorry. But, and actually, oh, well, anyway, I have no intention to call it IDSS. I will be calling it the entity, because that's way, way cooler. Uh, so, um, okay, so I'm going to, uh, uh, today, I, I'm going to talk about, um, well, multi-period trading um, uh, via convex optimization. And it, it's not about a, a principled approach. It, it's actually about kind of simple things you can do. Um, I will at one point say a little bit about uh, how you might compare this to a principled approach. Um, at, I'll get to that at some point in the talk. Um, and it it's actually was a, sort of an exercise uh, uh, done with about half people from uh, Stanford and half of them are from BlackRock and so they actually know what they're doing. Uh, so then the idea was just to set up a, a common framework to understand uh, what's the simplest way to describe it and things like that. So that's what we did. And that's what I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go over uh, uh, today. Um, okay, so uh, first um, I'll say a little bit about you know, what, what we're up to. Um, then we'll look at, uh, I'll, I'll describe the model. Uh, then we'll look at single period optimization and then multi-period optimization. And I'll, I'll say various things about it. And it's actually, I can t it's interesting for me to take a specific field and to find out how do people in that field use things like, for example, uh, statistics or optimization? I mean, actually, it's very interesting because it's like, what stories do they tell themselves about it? How do they talk? So it's almost, it's, an, it's anthropology. Okay, so, okay. So the setting um, is this, is, uh, so you have a portfolio of assets and you're gonna, uh, you, you're gonna hold this over multiple uh, periods, um, you, you know, buy and sell stuff. Um, and you're going to take into account, of course, things like uh, market returns, um, trading costs, holding costs, right? So, um, and you're going to choose trades based on, uh, you know, using forecasts updated each period, um, and respecting uh, constraints on uh, the trades and, and positions. Uh, so they're just going to be constraints that we're going to talk about. And, and the goal is, of course, to achieve, you know, high net return and low uh, risk. So, I mean, this is kind of the, the high-level uh, picture. Um, okay. Um, so trading strategies, I mean, there are some very simple ones. It's actually very interesting. There's a whole spectrum of, of what, what people do uh, in, this, in this area. Um, so there's, like, traditional ones that you just, you, you ask one of your friends that you trust or something or who has insider information, and they say you should buy this and whatever. And then... You buy it and you hold it or something, and then, or you could hold it and then rebalance. And I, I mean, and some of these actually sound kind of dumb. And then it turns out for most of the ones that sound dumb, you can actually reconstruct it by building a mathematical model under which that is the optimal thing to do. So I don't know if you got that, but um, so, so I mean, for, that's, an ex that's exactly this one, right? So you, you simply rank the assets from one to n, and you go long on the top 10, short on the bottom 10, and that's it. And it turns out that is actually optimal under a certain robust optimization uh, framework, right? So, OK. Um, uh, there's weird things you could do, like stat arb. That is, that is uh, slang, uh, so it's statistical arbitrage. And it's, I mean, so that's actually part of it is you, you have to learn the, so first you have to learn that dialect. And then first you develop like a pidgin language so you can have like minimal communication with people. And then after a while, you start speaking each other's language, right? So, um, uh, and then they have terms like momentum and reversion and things like that. Um, now, on the, uh, on the academic end, uh, you have, well, stochastic control. Because, I mean, that, that's the most, the most obvious formulation of this problem is stochastic control. Because you have things that are, that are random. I will get to that because they're not random. But the point is you have a... You, you can pretend that there, uh, that there are these random returns and other things like that. Um, and then uh, you're gonna do multi-period decisions and those decisions, uh, there's, an, you know, there's, an, there's an information space of what, you're, what, what you know when you know it and all that kind of stuff, stochastic control or dynamic programming or this sort of stuff. And then, then there's something that's kind of in between in mathematical sophistication, right? So this is extremely sophisticated and as I'll see later, more or less irrelevant. Um, doesn't have anything to do with anything, right? Um, uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is fine. 
Uh, but then, and then this is something like it's the geometric mean of the two extremes along some axis, right? So, okay. Um, so I'll talk, I, I'm going to talk about optimization-based trading. Um, and uh, the idea is you're going to solve an optimization problem to, uh, to determine trades, right? And this traces back to uh, Harry Markowitz. It's like 1952. Um, and simple versions are, are widely used. I would almost go as far as to say universally used. Uh, so so it's very, it would be very close to that. So any, any, every sort of quantitative hedge fund, I, this is what they do, okay? I mean, more or less. I mean, there, there's something missing. I'll say exactly what it is later, and that's actually the secret sauce, but this is kind of what people do, period. Um, uh, and the idea is that the trading policy is going to be, because that's actually a policy, because what's going to happen is you'll update information and predictions and forecasts, and then you'll solve an optimization problem. That's effect, that is the policy in the stochastic control uh, setting, right? Um, and the idea is that the trading policy is going to be shaped by selection of the objective terms, constraints, and hyperparameters, right? And so this is, this is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so, OK. So, you know, why, why would this be important now? And the, the main reason is that compared to 1952, we have a lot more uh, computer power, obviously. Um, there's uh, mature convex optimization technology, right? I mean, it's supposed to work all the time. I say that all the time. That's false, but you know, we pretend it is. And 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 for when people really need it to be, uh, when they really need to be reliable, it can be made reliable, right? So every case where it really, really needed to be reliable, people have made it reliable. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit. Of, I'll say more about this later. Um, and of course, there's growing availability of data and sophisticated forecasts, right? Um, and the interesting thing about it is that it, you can actually handle uh, pretty much all practical constraints and issues, right? O almost all. I mean, so I still, everywhere I go, people say, oh, yeah, this is non-convex. And it's a, it's a big old lie. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say more about that later, right, uh, at various times. OK. So um, well, let's look at a quick example. So here's a quick example is uh, we'll take, you know, S&P 500. And this doesn't matter, right? Um, we'll, took, we'll take the re daily realized returns and volumes over some four-year period. We'll start with a $100 million, just, this is stupid, but just uniformly spread over all of them for no reason. Um, we'll simulate uh, the market return forecast. And the, the reason is that, I mean, that's, that's really what you do, is, 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 is you forecast. That's the important part, right? And so instead of making some kind of silly one that actually attempts to do this, because the ones that people actually use are pretty sophisticated, instead of that, we just did the simplest thing ever. We took the actual returns and we corrupted them, I mean, quite a bit. Uh, but we got them to the point where they're, ac they're actually like the real forecasts people have, right? So that basically, you know, it's something like you get the sign right about 52% of the time or whatever. But, but so the, 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 the forecasts we're using are quite realistic, OK? So, um, and we'll do something like you know rank uh, rank trading, um, you know you do something like you buy the top ten, sell the bottom, and you and you set one percent daily turnover, right? And then we'll do something like single period optimization, and we'll use like a, an empirical factor risk model. And I'll, I'll talk about all these things later, right? Um, we'll use the forecast of transaction and holding cost. Uh, transaction cost you have to forecast because it's going to depend on the volume and the volatility, okay? And we'll we'll talk about that in in some detail, right? And then you have hyperparameters. That's something I'll, I'll talk about. It's just like in machine learning or control, or for that matter, anything else, where you do something that based on optimization. There are hyperparameters, and these are knobs that you turn to make the thing do what you want. Um, OK. Um, so we'll do that. We'll adjust the hyperparameters to match uh, the return. Uh, and uh, I guess that's it, just the return, right? So OK. So this would be the picture. And it might look something like this. Um, and by the way, you might look at this and say, oh, that, that, that blue thing looks good. That's fine. Um, but you'd really judge it by something like that, that the, the returns are about, you know, they're mad. I mean, that was done, that we adjusted hyperparameters to do that. And you can see that you have, like, substantially less risk. And if you kind of eyeball, I don't know what your uh, eyeball ability is to judge risk is, but, you know, it's lower. I mean, it's, it's visually lower and so on. OK, so that's just a quick, quick example. OK. So now I'll say a little bit about the model. Um, so the model, and actually, I'll, I'll go into enough detail here that you will actually know pretty much everything. So that, um, and nothing is going to be left out, because it's, it's actually just not that complicated. So um, it's this. Um, so you can, have, you can have a portfolio of N assets and a cash account. Uh, we'll have capital T time periods. It's discrete. 
uh, these could be days, hours, minutes, seconds. I mean, that is completely irrelevant, uh, what it is. Um, and what you'll do is you'll we'll denote the dollar holdings um, as HT, like this. So HT, the N plus first component, is going to be your cash holding on day. It's negative if you've borrowed money, positive if you, if you're, if you have some in your account. And the net portfolio value, we're going to call that VT, is just the sum of that. Right? So, oh, by the way, that's not the amount of uh, cash you could get, because to sell all those things or to make good on all the short positions, there'd be transaction costs. So, you, so if you actually cashed out, it, you would get less than that amount of cash. Right? But that's the, that's the nominal or putative value. Okay? Um, and so we're going to work, and a lot of people do this, we're going to work with the normalized portfolio or weights. And that's HT over VT. So these are numbers that add up to 1. Um, that does a lot of good things. Um, oh, they, don't, they do not have to be uh, non they, don't, they don't have to be positive or, or non-negative, right? They can be, they can be negative. Um, and if you take everything except for the cash, so if you take the risky assets and take the L1 norm of that, that's the leverage. Um, although it turns out there's about 14 different definitions of leverage, but they're all related to this. So you can, mul you can multiply this by two, subtract one. I, the, there's a lot of choices, and those are all called leverage. So um, d don't ask me why, but that's OK. OK. So um, the dynamics, so we're building actually the exact, this is the model. Um, and the, the dynamics is going to be this. Um, we're going to uh, look at, we're going to let UT be the dollar value trades, including cash. right? So if UT is positive, um, that means that I am actually, I'm, I'm, uh, as cash is going into the, the bank account. If it's negative, it means it's coming out. Um, and we're going to make a, a, an assumption that's completely incorrect. But it's fine. And it's going to be this, that your, model, your timing model is going to be this, that at, at the beginning, you're going to first take the initial thing. You're going to execute all the trades instantaneously. That's, of course, not what happens. And then you'll invest it for one period. And so that's, uh, that's just to make writing down actually the, the linear dynamical system that propagates things simple, right? Um, so we'll call the post-trade portfolio HT plus UT. Um, and we'll work with the normalized trades. So we'll take, that's the cash trade vector, and we'll divide that by the, the actual value, and that'll be the normalized trades. Okay? And the turnover then is simply, uh, it's, the, it's the sum of the absolute values of the buys and sells on the risky asset. Right? So that's, I mean, there's other definitions as well. Okay. Um, okay, so the uh, transaction cost is, is going to, we're going to denote it uh, this way. So uh, this is going to be a time t. There'll be a, a trading cost, and it'll be a function of the trades. I mean, of course, right? Um, the normalized uh, holding cost is going to be uh, this. So this is this is something that you. Um, it, this is going to be. Uh, oh, that's that's not. That shouldn't be. That should be W there. Okay. So that's a mistake. So okay. So this one is a function of the trades. Other is a is a function of the positions of what you're actually holding. Right. So. Um, and the, we'll make an assumption. These are separable across the assets, and they're zero for the cash account. Okay? So there's no transaction cash. Uh, a, go, there's no transaction cost going in and ca into cash or out. Um, and then you have a self-financing condition, which is this. Um, this is this is all normalized. So you divide by VT. Um, but if I if I were to unnormalize, if I just multiply this equation by VT, this would be the total the total cash going in uh, in dollars. Again, about this, if I multiply by VT, this would be the total cash that it costs me in trading costs. That's normally non-negative. It could, it could actually be negative. Uh, in some weird cases, it could be negative. Um, and, uh, oh, and by the way, we'll simply define this to be actually the difference between what I thought I was going to pay and how much I ended up paying. So that's literally the definition of, tra of transaction costs, right? You, there's detailed models of what it is, but I'll, I'll get to a, a very good macroscopic model in a minute. So, um, and then the, the holding cost uh, here, th this should be like you know, WT plus ZT here. Um, and the, the holding cost, that's the holding cost. And I'll, I'll talk about what these are in a, in a minute. And the idea is that this says you, that you self-finance. It says that you, you buy some stuff, you derive stuff, you, know, you, uh, you derive cash from that, you or sorry, you, you put cash in, you sell some stuff, cash comes in, and then there's the cash account, and it all just balances out. That, so that's the idea. So if you work out what this is, it basically determines the cash trade amount in terms of the asset holdings and trades. Right? So if you choose 
If you choose the asset trades here, and you know the asset holdings, then this here will simply determine uh, the cash trade. It tells you how much you're going to debit or pump into the cash account. Okay, so that's that's self uh, financing. Okay. Um, okay, so now we'll talk about the transaction cost model. So the actual mechanism of tra it's extremely complicated. There's a you know there's a limit order book, and you say you want to buy some stuff, and you know you 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 buy one thing, and then it depends on the depth of the book and the number you know what what's there. Um, in general, I mean, a simple model of that is that it's a piecewise linear convex function because you'd buy stuff at one if you you eat out you know, all the bids at one price, then you go to the next one and the next highest, and that would give you a piecewise linear convex one. Um, it is, uh, it's always convex, I mean, kind of period. Um, uh, and here is a, a, a just a, a perfectly good macroscopic model of it, and I'll say a little bit about it. Um, so uh, the first is that there's a, there is a, a um, there's actually an amount uh, that is proportional to the absolute value of, of, of the uh, transaction, okay? And this is, uh, this can model a lot of things. If there's a bid-ask spread, so that we're using the midpoint as the, as the putative price and the value, so that if you want to buy or sell, you're going to have to go up, uh, up by half the bid-ask spread or down before you start buying stuff, and that, that'll immediately give you one model for A, but it can model other things as well. Um, there is another term uh, which is super linear, and that's actually very important. That models the fact that you're gonna eat through the book or something. It actually models a whole bunch of things, but it basically says that it, it, there's a super linear cost, and it says that as you eat through the book, if I, if I ask, I mean, this doesn't matter if you buy or sell a small amount, but if you buy or sell a large amount, this matters. And it says that if you buy a lot, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna eat through the book, everything at one price, you're gonna be forced to the next and the next and stuff like that, and then all of that you're going to, uh, you're gonna pay more for, and that's gonna be here. And this is from, this comes from a very, this is a very simple model that people have used for a long time and seems pretty good. You can have a fancier one if you want. Um, and it's this, it's, X, it's, it's, the, it's the trade amount to the three halves divided by the square root of the volume, multiplied by the volatility, and then some coefficient b, right? And, by the way, B equals one is perfectly good choice there. Um, so uh, the volume is the volume uh, traded. It, let's say this is daily. It's the vol. It's the daily volume of that asset, right? So, so actually, an interesting thing here is that you don't know this and you don't know that when you choose the trades. So you actually don't know what the transaction cost is going to be. Um, I mean, these are much easier to predict than, for example, the return. But you don't know what the transaction cost because you have to. So you actually have a forecaster that is forecasting your transaction cost, right? Um, this is a linear term. These are symmetric for x. If you flip the sign on x, the buy and sell are the same. And this allows you to skew uh, buy and sell transaction costs so that, for example, one could be less than the other, okay? So, and from the, from the point, and that would happen if you decide, if you go against the market or with it or if you move with it, you, you get a linear, you, it, it tilts, right? So, um, and I'll, I think from the point of view of optimization, it, it, the critical part is this, is, uh, I mean, that's actually not at all a bad model, um, but the main thing is that this is gonna be a term in an optimization problem, and this is something that's gonna discourage trades. Uh, those of you who know about convex optimization know that if you have a cost function that's like an absolute value, that's like an L1 thing, and this is actually going to, gonna, gonna end up with sparse trades, right? That's standard sort of convex optimization if you put an L1 norm in there. Um, this discourages Big trades because it's super linear. Yeah. Oh, you can make a perfectly good model of this with make this being square. I mean, three halves just looks cool because I don't know. So, um, I mean, it's kind of cool, right? So, so I would say there's a slight coolness advantage, but it turns out you can model this perfectly well. And then there's just two terms. One term is it penalizes trades absolute value, and that's going to give you sparsity. And the second term discourages big trades, and that's what splits them up across multiple days and things like that. Okay, so. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is the idea. Um, and if you normalize it, of course this has the right units. I mean, it has to or it's a stupid model. When you divide everything by the total, by the, the value, every, it, you get exactly the same model. But instead of using the volume, which is the actual volume in dollars here, uh, you get the volumes relative to your uh, total portfolio value, right? So all that makes sense. So that, that's your, your transaction cost model. Um, you can make lots of holding cost models, but a reasonable one um, is this, is you'll simply, we'll just do 
shorting costs. So when I hold an asset short, um, I borrowed it from somebody and they charge, that there's some, at least some collateral insurance or something like that. I'm gonna be charged for it. Um, and so this is, would be just a simple linear one. You could make all sorts of fancier ones if you want, right? And that's a, this is gonna be, this is for a single asset. And then you'd have a shorting cost rate for each asset, right? Um, and you, there's lots of, you could have a quadratic term, piecewise linear and all that sort of stuff. And, you, and this is homogeneous, so you're gonna get exactly the same formula for a normalized uh, portfolio. It's gonna be the same. Um, okay, so the investment, so we're, I'm just working through the exact model that we're gonna use for simulation. Um, so the, uh, the way it's, I mean, it's really simple. The timing diagram is this. Uh, you're gonna start with HT. You're gonna do instantaneous trades. That, that's silly, because you don't. And then you are going to uh, get a return. Uh, this is the Hadamard or pointwise product, and so, and this is one plus the return, so that would be the total return. And it says you're simply going to multiply each each entry of what you have. That's a that's this multiplying by diagonal matrix with these entries, right? So, that's the idea. Um, and these would be the the asset and cash returns. This this vector here, right? So, okay. Um, and when you work out uh, what it is, the if you want to look at the total portfolio return, it's the new putative value minus the current one divided by the current one. And that turns out to be just this. And it all makes total sense, right? It's that, that would be the nominal return. That's your post-trade That's your post -trade holdings. So it's your, it's your nominal return times your post-trade post holdings minus transaction cost minus their holding costs, right? So that all makes, and this, there's no, I mean, if you believe this, which is uh, not true, but if you, if you pretended you believed it, then this would, there's been no approximations so far, right? So, so now you can do a lot of things. You can simulate, right? So you can build a simulator. And a simulator uh, would, would take any trading policy. A trading policy would, get, would determine Z or U uh, dependent on whatever is available at that time, right? So that would be, uh, I mean, it would obviously be everything in the past, but it would then be whatever, whatever you're doing, right? If you're like, you know, looking at Twitter feeds or doing something, you know, some silly thing, you know, that kind of stuff, you, that's what you would do, okay? So you would, that, that goes into, the, the for, we'll see the forecast, right? Um, okay, and what happens is, you, you, so you, you evaluate the trading policy and you get this, that's what you buy and sell. Um, and then from that, from the self-financing condition, this tells you the exact amount of cash to debit or credit to the, to the cash account. Um, and then you, uh, you simply update the, uh, the portfolio weights and value, right? So you can do a back test. So I can, I can try, you know, Devrat's algorithm or whatever, and I'll simply use the realized past returns, volumes, volatilities. And then we can try yours and Laurent. We, we can try your two algorithms, do a back test or something like that. You can do a stress test, and, or you could do model calibration. Model calibration is I go back and tweak the various parameters I have in my model to, to actually make it track uh, what really happened. Okay. Um, now we're going to talk about doing this with uh, making these selections with optimization, right? So, um, okay. So let's talk about that. Um, so the, you start, I mean, of course, when you make the trades, I mean, of course, you don't know what the returns are going to be. That's ridiculous. I mean, if you did, uh, you would make a lot. And you wouldn't need optimization, by the way, in that case. Uh, so so um, that's kind of the whole point, right? So um, you would look. What you're going to do is you're going to get, uh, you're going to get forecasts of the return, uh, the, the, the transaction cost, and the holding cost. And this, I mean, in our simple model, this, might, this is dependent on the volatility and the volume, so you'd have predictions of that. And those are, those are fine, not critical, and they're very easy to do. Um, and the same for here. You might even just know these, right? Um, but uh, so this one, of course, that's the big one, right? So, so that, that, that's the important one, right? And, and these are obviously not going to be very good. Uh, they're going to be things that are, you know, it, they're going to be right in sign 51% of the time, 50, you know, so if you're lucky, right, 52% of the time. OK. So these are forecasts. Um, these are these. I mean, the, it doesn't matter because you can forecast them pretty well, as well as it matters. Um, and so this is the idea. Um, so that's going to be your estimated. That's estimated uh, portfolio return. Um, and then uh, you'll simply do this, right? You will maximize the estimated portfolio return, and then uh, minus. Then you'll have a, a risk term. So this is a risk adjustment. And uh, we'll talk, we're going to talk uh, about risks in a, in a minute. Um, so 
this, this is, that'd be the model, this is a risk adjustment. And you know, you could just, you could also put this as a constraint. I mean, what this doesn't, these, that's another, that's just a small variation on this, right? And uh, you'll have a, an allowed trading set. Uh, you'll have an allowed portfolio holding set. And then you'll have your self-financing condition. So, uh, and the way this works is this. Uh, this is actually affine or linear. And actually, it's affine in your, um, in, in your trades, which is what you're about to choose. Um, uh, this is, uh, the, the, all reasonable ones are convex, right? So unreasonable ones are not convex. People use unreasonable ones, but that's their problem, right? Um, you know, this is generally convex, that's convex. Uh, so, and by the way, so are these. And the only minor problem is that this is, uh, this, this inequality constraint is not convex, right? So, and there's a couple of things you could do. You can relax this constraint and you get a, that, then you get a, and show that it's, I mean, it, 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 were, it it's tight. Um, but actually, it turns out you can actually just ignore these. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. And, and it's actually, uh, it's a second order effect, right? Um, okay, so here, that's gonna be a risk measure, and that's gonna be a risk aversion parameter. So this is the, the idea. So you're gonna, you're gonna maximize uh, its estimated net return. So that's net of transaction costs and holding costs. Um, and then you're gonna adjust for some risk. Or if you don't like this, you know, put the risk in, you could even build the risk into this, it's fine. Okay, um, so single period, uh, is, is you're gonna, what you're gonna do is you're gonna approximate the self-financing constraint by simply dropping the last two terms. That looks suspicious because it looks like you're ignoring the transaction costs and the holding costs. Um, actually, it turns out you're not. I mean, so it's very easy to show that this is a very small term. It's, it's, for, it's second order. Um, and, and then you end up with something that just looks like this, right? So that's your, that's, that's, and here's the simplified one. This is now a convex problem, right? That's a convex optimization problem. So, so now we're, 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 we're good to go, okay? And, uh, and, you know, this is like a lot of other things, like, well, kind of every other time you use optimization. Um, this is a, the optimization problem is a surrogate for what you really want. And then when you use it, uh, these, that's a knob that you turn, the choice of this and this and this. These are, uh, these are choices that, these are directives you are giving to the, to the optimization. This determines a policy. It's a sophisticated policy. It's driven by the forecasts of various things. And then it executes, it then comes out with a trade list, right? And so these are, you, you can shape the policy by choosing these things um, and choosing, uh, for example, that hyperparameter, okay? So, and that's actually how essentially all of, it's very rare that an optimization problem is really an optimization problem, right? I mean, every now and then it actually is. Like, that's really the objective. Those are really the constraints. But normally, the objective is totally made up. So, and that's typical use, right? Because you're, if you're doing supply chain, you'd say, oh, what's that? Oh, that's the cost for, you know, I don't know if a customer doesn't get what they want in two days. And you're like, well, you know, where'd you get that parameter in front of it? And they go, oh, I totally made it up. I mean, it's just a knob that you turn to make this do what you want, right? So you turn the knob up, and it's gonna be a policy that presumably less frequently is gonna have people waiting more than two days. I mean, and it's the same thing here, so, okay. So now I'll say a little bit, first I'll, I'll go over what the traditional risk measure is. So the tradi traditional risk measure is, is, is quadratic, and that's usually justified with a lot of like religious sort of, you know, trappings around it that talks about how these are normal or log normal. I don't know. I mean, there's all this stuff, most of which is kind of, I mean, it's, it's kind of true to even, almost first order. Not even, actually, not even quite first order, right? Because, okay, so that would be the, the usual thing. And then this would be like the variance or something. But for us, it's basically just, I, I actually, a better model of it is it's simply a function that says how pissed off, how much it makes you nervous to hold a certain portfolio. That's actually really what it is, okay? And if you choose to interpret it as variance under some, you know, model of uh, that these things are like, you know, some stochastic process, please go ahead, right? So, but that's, that's really what it is. Um, um, so in that, that would be, and people, that's how people talk about it. They talk about it as if that were tr the case, right? Um, and this is usually something like uh, a factor model. So there are some factors. Uh, it's a low rank plus diagonal model. Um, and they have beautiful words for this. For example, D is called, uh, these are the factor exposures. 
And some, of the, some factors have names, other, you know, they, they say, oh, you're exposed to momentum or you're too exposed to developing, I don't know. This, this is the kind of stuff people would say, right? Um, uh, so these are the, and then that's a, that's a, a factor covariance uh, matrix. Um, and then DT is, is, uh, is, is diagonal. And that means it's, it's independent, it's, you know, or the model is it's independent of each thing. And that's called idiosyncratic uh, risk, which is, I think, you know, it's a beautiful term. Okay. Now, you can do various things. Once you realize you're going to do all these things by convex optimization, it, it opens the door to all sorts of things much closer to what you might really want. So, for example, uh, you might actually do this. You might say, you know what? If I, I, if actually, please run at an annualized risk of 5%. Like, I, I, I don't show me a policy that runs at an annualized risk of 1%, I'm not interested, or 40%, I'm not interested. And so you might do something like choose a target here, take this quadratic function minus this target, and take the positive part, right? And this would do just what you think it would do. If I take the positive part of one thing minus another and optimize, then typically this is going to be that or, or a little bit. It'll, it'll bump a little bit above if it has to and all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, so that would be. And this is convex because that's convex, convex. And this, the positive part is convex and increasing. So that's going to be convex. OK, so OK. Um, but now you can start, once you can start getting, it can get more interesting. Um, this will be, I mean, it's actually kind of interesting. That starts getting interesting. You can do things like this. Um, you can do things like uh, make a, work, a worst case quadratic risk. So you can actually take, let's say, M models or for M scenarios or market regimes. And then you would say, uh, actually, my risk is going to be the maximum over these regimes, right? And, and people would actually do this, and it makes per perfect sense. Like, you could actually label these things like, you know, that was quarter, that's the sigma I derived from the data from quarter three, 2008, or something like that, right? Or you could do this. You could have multiple things here that are conditioned on things like uh, uh, vol market volatility. So you could, have, you could have one sigma for VIX high, one for VIX low. Say, for example, right? Um, and I mean, these are all like cool things you can do. Um, by the way, it's actually critical that you take a nonlinear function of these and not a linear function. If you take a linear function, if you say, oh, there's M market regimes and they have probabilities pi one up to pi M, then you add them up again. Guess what? You're back at a quadratic, right? So you, that's that's kind of not the point. Uh, you can do other interesting things. I mean, here's one, um, which is this. Uh, and this is just from robust uh, optimization and things like that. So you would say, well, look, here's this covariance matrix. And actually, I don't know the covariance matrix, which to say, I mean, first of all, there is no covariance matrix, number one. We can start with that. But pretending even that you know that there's a covariance matrix, then you could ask, how well do you know the entries? And the answer is you don't, right? So you're going to say that the, what, what you're going to do is you're going to have the, 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 the maximum over the over covariances, where you can perturb the covariance matrix in such a way that this is you know positive definite, and the following is true. Uh, it says that the you can perturb the ij entry by some fraction, say times the geometric mean of the diagonals, and what this means is you're going to perturb the correlations by let's say plus minus kappa. Okay, so reasonable number, kappa is 0.05. Actually, anybody who alleges that they know correlations between uh, asset returns, or that's ridiculous. But even uh, factor returns, better than 5% is a big old liar, right? So it doesn't make any sense, right? So, th so this makes perfect sense. And this, it turns out, it's an exercise to work out what it is. But it's a beautiful, you end up with a very nice uh, expression for it. It's this. That's the nominal risk. And then you get an extra risk, which is the robust, which is a, a, a penalty. Um, for, again, holding a portfolio. And it's actually a beautiful thing. It's an L1, it's a weighted L1 norm squared. Um, and uh, they're weighted exactly by the volatilities, right? So in fact, I think I once was talking to someone about this, I looked at it and he said, oh, that's exactly what we do. And I was like, oh, cool, did you know this? And they're like, no. So I was like, oh, why'd you do it? And they go, it just seems like a really good idea. So I was, it's fine, I mean, it's, it's fine. So it's, but anyway, so, okay. Um, you can have return forecast risk. Um, and that would mean that you'd say, I mean, these are, remember, this is a very crude approximation of what R is, right? And so you're going to have uncertainty on it. And like the most elementary model would be that you would have, um, that the most elementary model is you'd have a range for each one. So you'd say each R is R, you know, uh, plus minus rho, 
right? So that each, each entry, right? So you'd say, oh, I think that's going to go up, you know, six, 12% plus minus three. I don't know. I'm just, you know, that, that'd be the kind of thing. Um, and so the idea is row I is the forecast return spread for, for asset I. Um, this is also a simple calculation in robust optimization. You get something analytical here, too. And, what, and if you work out what this is, if you say, what's the worst return? I mean, it's kind of obvious what to do. I mean, if this is positive, uh, then you would take uh, delta to be small. And if this is negative, you take that. And what you end up with is this. That's the nominal return. Uh, that's the nominal return prediction. And then this term is actually, that's risk. That's, forecast, that's return forecast risk based on the spread of values, right? And it's very cool because it's actually, this is a, a holding, it's a holding term, it's an L1 thing. And of course, again, as you know, when you solve problems with an L1 term, um, you're gonna end up with something sparse. And so this is also does something, and so it means you're gonna actually not hold certain assets, and someone's gonna say why, and you're gonna say, well, because, it's actually because the, I am so uncertain about the risk uh, that actually uh, holding it doesn't make any sense, right? So, by the way, you might imagine that this would be zero um, when uh, your forecast risk uh, uh, straddles zero, right? Because if you think about what that means, it means someone says, well, tell me about that asset. You go, well, it might go up. It might also go down. And this doesn't sound good, right? It turns out that's actually not true. These are very complicated problems. No human being can work them out. And that's actually what you have this convex optimization thing to do. Um, it's even more than that. You can hold zero of things where the, where the risk spread is all positive or all negative. Because it's complicated. It has to do with all the other stuff and things like that. So it's not, it, it's not, it's, it's not, it's usually not obvious, right? So, okay. So you have holding constraints, and this is going to pretty much cover all of the one, I mean, the real ones. Uh, I'll tell you some fake ones in a minute and things that are easy to fix. Um, you can have long only. That says that you can only hold non-negative positions. You can have a leverage limit. Um, a real thing would be a capitalization limit. So you, you say you'll, you should never hold more than 3% of a company or something like that. I'm just making that up, but that would be a reasonable thing. Um, you have a weight limit, right? You could say, actually, I, I don't want... I don't want to own any more than, five, I don't want 5% of my value to be in any one asset. That's fine. Um, you have a minimum cash balance. You could be have factor, uh, factor or sector neutrality. That'd be like market, ne market neutrality would be very standard. Um, you can have a liquidation loss limit. So uh, this is an interesting one. So that's the trading cost here. And if I tell you, if I, if I walk up to you and I press the big red button that says liquidate, um, oh, I'd have to give an, an optional argument to it, which is the number of days, number of periods to liquidate it over. Um, then because the trading cost, if I ask you to liquidate, because the trading cost is convex, you will lick, and I ask you to do it in T days, the optimal, the optimal thing to do is actually to linear, is to trade the same amount every day. That's Jensen's inequality. So you do that. And that says you're going to trade, that's your holder position. You will, you will trade exactly that amount each day. That's, that's the number of days. You'll have phi trade. And then you'll multiply by this because you, you suffered that liquid, that cost every day, right? So, um, and this would be a limit. Oh, by the way, those who know a bunch about convex optimization would recognize that this function is jointly convex in W, in, in Z, that's the variable, and T liquidate. So, which is kind of cool, but okay, fine. Um, then you get crazy stuff like this. Uh, but I think people generally don't know this. Like, here's one. This is, when you put the brackets there, it's the largest components, right? So, so sub one is the largest, is actually the largest thing that you hold. Uh, two is the second largest three. And this says, please sum up the capital K largest amounts. And that has to be less than omega. And what that says is, I don't want, I don't want any, I don't want to, you could do, you could impose a constraint that says this. I do not want more than 15% of my value to be concentrated in, fewer than 12 names. There, I just made that up. But that's just this inequality. Um, that's actually a very sophisticated inequality. Um, it is not obvious immediately that it's convex. E and even when you think, it, when you realize it is, it sounds like it's combinatorial. And it sounds combinatorial, but you can actually handle this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a completely straightforward way. Right, so, okay. So, uh, so there are other ones which are weird and kind of silly and don't matter. I mean, one would be, OK, you have to hold like you know integer multiples of lots or something. And then you just round. And everything else is so approximate that that's, that's lost in the, uh, that, that's lost. Um, OK. I'll, OK, that's fine. We'll go on. Trading constraints. You might have a turnover limit. 
which is, says, of course, that's your turnover and you limit it. Um, you might have a limit to trading volume. This would be absolutely all, like always. And you might have a transaction cost limit that you simply say, I'm, I'm not going to, everything's normalized, right? So if this was, if that was 0.01, that would be bad. It just means that you just, you're proposing trades that will actually have a trading cost that's 1% of your full value. I mean, you might do that in an emergency or something, but that, that would be, okay. So these are the kinds of things you'd have. Um, so the idea is these are all convex, right? Um, uh, and the consequences are you, you can solve it uh, globally. Um, I mean, honestly, that's, that's probably n not less important than a lot of other things. Um, the main thing is it's actually reliable and fast. Uh, that's actually very important. Um, so, um, and you can add all these objective terms and things like that, and that is the right way to do it, right? The, the right way to do it is not to try to be smart and figure out when something's going to be a problem and then add it in. Add everything in. That's, that's what you're using optimization for. You add them all in, and you let it sort it out. And you, you add in, in fact, the right way to run this is you run these things with lots of constraints in there that are never active. That's good. That means you're, that's actually just what you should be doing. And someone says, why is that constraint there? And you go, just in case. And it's, that's very sensible, right? So someone who tried to like, you know, say, oh, we don't need that because this leverage limit is going to like, throw everything in. So OK. Um, now, non-convexities, I, I have this argument, I don't know, once every month or something when I talk to somebody. And they're very silly arguments. So I'm, I may just make like YouTube ones for each one and, and say, go there. Because it, they're just like really dumb. Uh, I mean, they're obvious, right? You know, quantized positions. Well, you know, round. You know, and then by the way, you can round and then you can resolve. I mean, and the whole, th all of these are just approximations and surrogates, so that doesn't matter. Um, other things are fairly easy to do as well. Um, so this is a fun one. This this happens to me, I don't know, once every couple of months. I'm somewhere and they go, oh well, we have we we have a leverage, not a limit, but a target. The first thing I say is you realize that's stupid, right? Because basically, you solve it with the relaxation. If it comes in at that level, then you're, glo you're optimal, that's fine. So, but when it comes in less than it, it says, you know, excuse me, you're, you're, about to, you're about to either give up return, increase risk, in order to increase your leverage. So you have to, I'd make them sign a waiver that says, I agree this is an in, in, a really stupid thing to do, blah, 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 so, okay. But this is e extremely easily done if you know what we call street fighting convex optimization, right? So street, street fighting means, means you know, like, how do you handle something like that? It's extremely easy, and I'll tell you right now. It's just that what you do, you put the relaxation in here. If it comes up tight, done. That's it. You're done. It's global. You just go on. If this comes up less than this, then you're going to send a message saying, you understand this is stupid. I'm about to make a trade that's going to either, like, decrease your, your expected return or increase your risk for no good reason. Okay, fine. Uh, but the way, what you do then is this. When you solve that problem, um, what, you, what happens is you simply, what you do is you solve it once with the relaxation and you use that to determine the sign of the post-trade holdings, right? And the sign could be negative, which is short, zero, or positive. So you're either short, long, or you're not holding, right? Once you know the sign of something, then the L1 norm is a linear function, of course, right? And then, so you solve it a second time. So the first time you find the signs, the second time you do it, and everything balances, everything's perfect, right? Does that solve the problem globally? Of course not. Actually, probably in most cases, of course it does. But I mean, who cares? So we'll, OK, fine. So OK. Um, so how do you use single period uh, optimization? So this is actually kind of, uh, this is actually interesting. And it's actually very interesting to me because it seems to be the exact same story in everything I've ever looked at. Control, uh, let's see, machine learning is identical story. It, it, it's all the same. And it goes like this. Um, that you start with constraints and objective terms that are inspired by an actual model. Uh, that's fine. That's good because it gets the scaling right. It tells you that it's, it's, much, it's much cheaper to trade Apple than some tiny little you know, thing that just went public or something. That's fine. Um, so it gets the scaling right. Um, but then you add hyperparameters that scale the terms. For example, I can scale the, 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 the trading cost and the holding cost. These are exactly as in control and exactly as in machine learning. These are knobs that you turn to get to what you want. So the knobs are basically part of your directive to the optimizer to either try to do certain things, try to avoid certain things, try to avoid certain trades, try to avoid holding certain things, right? So that, 
works like this. Um, so for example, if I scale up and down the absolute value in, in the trading term, that, of course, it gives you sparse trades. And it discourages, it, if, if you don't like that you're trading little bits and pieces and somebody doesn't like that, I don't know why. But, oh, in a minute, I'll say exactly how you would do this, right? And, and it should not be an aesthetic thing. You will do it only by backtesting, otherwise known as like, you know, validation. So that's, that's how you can do it. Okay, so if you turn this up and down, you discourage small trades. If you scale the three halves power term, that is actually, if you, you think of the, half, the three halves power term, what, it, it's at, what it's actually doing is it is discouraging large trades. So when you turn it up, the, the, if you look at the histogram or the distribution of trades when you test it, it you're going to have fewer that are large and they're going to be spread over multiple days. Okay? Um, you can scale up the shorting cost. And basically what that means is that's not the actual cost you're going to pay for shorting. What it is, it's a directive to the optimizer to please avoid short positions, right? And then we'll, how, we'll say how to find these things in a minute. Um, liquidation costs. So it's, you have no intention of liquidating, li liquidating anything. I mean, so what it is is the liquidation cost is a directive to the optimizer to avoid holding illiquid assets. Okay, so and this is the right way to think of it. By the way, this is exact same in machine learning. It's exact same in control. It's exact same in any, anything where you use optimization to do something, where the optimization is a surrogate. Um, I mean, it's the same for supply chain. It's the same for all of these things, right? Um, you choose these hyperparameters uh, by simulation and backtest. So that, that's kind of the right way to do it. Um, I don't think there is any other way, right? So, um, and it's the same story, right, in, in, in other areas, right? So, okay. Uh, all right, so we'll look at a quick example. So again, it's a tiny little, it's a little problem. Um, and what we'll do is, uh, the risk model is going to be a very simple thing. It, you know, uh, I mean, these are all just very simple, but kind of reasonable things. And then what we're going to do is going to vary the, these hyperparameters over, over ranges, right? Uh, you can do this obviously in a, in a fancier way. And you get pictures that look like this, right? Um, and these are for different values. The, these, this is, uh, the, the scale, these points are where you're varying a risk aversion, and you get what you typically would expect, which is a, a, a trade off of risk and return. Um, but the different lines here are for different, uh, different factors of, of multiple, you're scaling the transaction cost. You're actually changing the turnover by doing this. Um, and you get things that are not obvious at all. Like for example here, uh, looks like your best bet is to have your, your uh, trading uh, factor hyperparameter to be six, right? You do much worse if it's eight, right? Because that, that means you're trading less and evidently, I mean you can give a story after the fact. You could say, well, well, if I turn the hyperparameter up too much, I discourage trading, I, and I, I don't move into things fast enough to take uh, what, whatever. You could make up some story, right? Um, and then you would say, well, what about this one? And you'd say, oh, that's simple. Uh, in that case, I'm trading too much, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making more, but then I'm losing more than I'm making in transaction costs or something. Okay, so that's the story. But, uh, but again, this is done entirely. You, the only correct way to do this is by uh, backtest. So, okay. And you could do something like search over all these things and then identify the Pareto, uh, the, the Pareto points, and you'd get something uh, like this, right? And th that would be what you'd get. And this would be the, the idea. Now you can do this in, a, in more sensible ways than this. But okay. Um, so uh, actually what I'm going to say about this is uh, this is just sort of timing for doing a back test. And actually I'll say that one thing that's very interesting is, I mean, I, in control, um, a lot of it is that you would simulate at multiples of real time, right? Because you'd use a high level thing like Python or Julia. I see, I said it, okay. So, um, yeah, so you would use something like that. They would, they would execute in a, in a variable amount of time and a multiple of real time. And so you might simulate you know, 10 minutes of some control thing in a couple of hours, right? Hey, who cares, that's fine. Um, so it's the opposite uh, here, that if you're doing daily trading, you know, you can almost solve these convex problems by hand. That's a joke. But, um, so, but the point is, you, so, th so what you want here are that these problems can be solved quickly. Um, I can tell you what the numbers are here. This is a very amateur uh, implementation, nothing optimized. And it's about 0.2 seconds per uh, solve. Actually, I can tell you what, the, what the, the real number is if you actually try. It's about 10 milliseconds. Okay, so you can solve a, this is a 500 variable problem. You could make it much larger, and you can make 10 milliseconds 
with three halves power, the whole thing. If you know what you're doing, you can make that 10 milliseconds. That's very cool, because it means you can do a 10-year back test in four seconds, single thread. So that means, unlike a little tiny computer that sits under a desk, like with 32 cores, you run 64 hyper threads, if you can do a, a single back test in four seconds, you work it out, but the point is overnight, you can do some serious, uh, you can test some very, a very serious number of variations of hyperparameters and different constraints and things like that, right? Uh, or you could do stress tests, all sorts of crazy stuff. So, um, so, so it's interesting in, in, in some fields, the critical part is that, is that for run, the critical runtime constraint is when you, actually, when you actually field it, and in other cases when you simulate it. And this is a case when you simulate it. So, okay. So I'll talk about multi-period uh, optimization. Um, so the idea is that instead of, so it's very easy to make fun of the single period thing, right? It's myopic. It, I mean, it appears to be myopic, right? Because it's, it's just saying, you know, how, I'm just thinking about, I'm gonna assess a trade by how much it costs me to execute the trade and how much I like or dislike the final, the position I end up holding, right? So that's, oh, and then I balance that against what I imagine I'm gonna make on the trade, right? So. Um, it sounds myopic if you do stochastic control or anything like that. It sounds silly. Um, uh, okay, so then you would imagine you could do several things. I mean, one would be what we would call, you know, MPC, sort of model predictive control or receding horizon control. It's got lots of names in different fields. But what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to you're going to actually uh, optimize over a sequence out to a horizon, um, and uh, what you're going to do is actually work out a complete plan of action of trades. You have no intention of executing any of them except the first. And then at the next step, you're gonna do it again. And by the way, you can do this in the case, this is if, if the horizon rolls in front of you, that's just normal operating. But for example, if you wanna close down or you wanna ramp up, you do the same thing and it works perfectly, right? So if someone says cash out, this is what you should do, not trade evenly each day. You, and then you just change, you, you change the, you add a terminal constraint. Okay, so you'll have a, a, a forecast and you'll have our hat tau given t, and that will be your prediction of the return in period tau given t. So, and remember that r hat, r hat t given t is already pretty poor, so you can imagine how, uh, how tau plus 10 given t is, right? So, but that's the idea. And this allows you to do all sorts of weird stuff, things that people know about. You'd have a, a signal, right, would be some idea of whether something's gonna go up or down, and there would be like the signal half-life, right? You would be, you know, you say, well, that one's good for 10 days, that one's, that, that one's good only tomorrow, you know, that kind of thing. So, and you would build that into this. And so this is actually, it's a very good way to exploit differing short and long-term forecasts, right? So, so and it, it, if you're using machine learning to predict things, it's totally obvious. You predict one day ahead, you predict five day ahead if you're doing daily, right? And you predict 20 day ahead forecasts. These are completely separate predictors. And of course, they can be contradictory. You can say, well, I think it's gonna go up in a day. It's gonna be down in five and up in 20. And then the question is, what do you do? And then something like this would actually tell you what to do. And the answer is it depends on all sorts of stuff, including like the transaction costs and all sorts of liquidity, all sorts of crazy risk. Okay, so here's multi-period optimization as you solve this uh, big problem. Um, and, um, and this is the, the idea. Actually, one very important thing is that the computational cost, um, normally when you solve an optimization problem, you know, the, the cost is gonna scale super linearly in the problem size, right? In this case, it does not and cannot, if, if, if you know what you're doing, it will, it will scale linearly because of the structure of, of, the, uh, of the optimization problem. So, um, and this is basically just model predictive control. Okay, so we'll look at this and we'll look at uh, two, two forecasts. You're gonna make two forecasts and you'd get something that would look like that. I mean, okay, it's fine. I mean, most of this is made up, or I, should, I shouldn't say that. The forecasts are simulated Everything else is actually exactly the real data, like the exact returns, the exact uh, volumes, and the exact volatilities and things like that. So, okay, um, and then you might compare, you know, the multi-period and single period and stuff like that. And again, these things are made up, so it's not, you know, it's not clear how much. It just says that it does something. Um, okay, so uh, let me let me uh, conclude. Um, so the idea is that I mean, the whole idea traces to uh, Markowitz. Um, which, by the way, had no inequality constraints and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it was based on this idea where there was like covariances and means and you'd have the inverse covariance times the mean and th that's fine, that's great. Um, but the idea is you can throw in actually an enormous number of 
absolutely practical. As far as I'm concerned, every practical constraint and, thing, and term that you can imagine you can throw in there. There's a few things you can't handle, but most of them you can. Um, and it's actually a very nice way to set things up. You set it up as, as a trading engine, and the input is simply forecasts. And then, obviously, where should you put your effort? You know, duh, in the forecasts. I mean, this is kind of obvious, right? But the point is, the nice thing is if you spend all your time coming up with good forecasts, at least you should have a nice trading engine that's going to do the right thing with it, right? So, so this is the, uh, th that's, that's the conclusion. Um, so I want to finish with one last thing. So this is, uh, the question is, is it optimal? So, um, so that's a weird question. Right? Uh, so first of all, we'd have to adopt, make the religious assumption that the returns are log normal and independent or something, let's say, right? Which is both of which are false, but let's suppose that that were the case and stationary or whatever, right? Um, uh, so then, but supposing you actually assumed that this was the case, right? Then it, it's a convex stochastic control problem. You can't solve it except in incredibly trivial cases, like for example, um, if everything was quadratic, if the dynamics were linear, which, well, the dynamics are linear, but if it was quadratic transaction costs and quadratic holding costs, you could solve it exactly by a Riccati recursion. Okay? But other than that, you cannot. Um, so a while ago, uh, some subset of us, I think with Mark Mueller, who's here somewhere anyway, we, so you can actually start from this um, and then actually build, uh, build a, a, a lower bound, a computational lower bound for the optimal value of that stochastic control problem. Solve that, that's some giant optimization problem. But you actually get a number and you would say, nobody can do better than this number, 13%. That's it, no one can do better. Then you can actually run Monte Carlo with your policy. And what we found is it's essentially impossible for practical ranges of values. These, the things I showed you which look extremely unsophisticated are basically optimal. So, um, but you know, I think in some sense this is silly because real returns are not log normal, they're not independent, they're not stationary, and they're not even a stochastic process, right? They, what they really are is their whatever, you know, insider trading and other things happened and all sorts of other crazy stuff. And it's, you integrate that over a whole lot of agents and that's what you get. So, okay. So I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll make a, a couple of, I, well, I, we don't need this because you just go to Google and type stuff in and you'll find, find things about this. Uh, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back and, and just leave it here. And I'll, I'll, I'll quit here and I'll be happy to answer any questions about this. Yeah. I don't include taxes, it's just a linear term, right? Because yeah. it's multi, yeah. I assume your whole period is less than a year, so just multiply by 70%. For, right, okay. right. So uh, actually, it, it's to, to do it, I mean, the real stuff is really complicated, but why? If it's just if if you're trading for less, hold periods less than a year, shorts are. You'd have to you'd have to get into like which lots and stuff. I mean, it's crazy. But if and if you want to do the long and short, it's also a huge. I mean, sorry, a lo, short yeah, term yeah. and long term, it's a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. So. Oh, okay. You could be holding things over a year. Agreed. Right. Um, right. The um, are you trying to optimize? average returns for the holder because a family office perspective, you want geometric returns, not arithmetic, so mm -hmm. you have to correct for the volatility squared over two, which is easier to do. Yes. But I think uh, I would like geometric yes. returns long right. term. So if, if you, so that's, a, that's another regime, right, where the return in one period is actually not, if, if, they're, if they're small enough, it doesn't matter. And it's so approximate anyway, right? So then it doesn't matter, to geometric versus uh, arithmetic. That is true. So. If, however, you, a lot of this can be repeated in a different scenario where the periods, are, where the returns are not small, not small compared to one. That puts you into the, that puts you into Kelly, uh, Kelly gambling formulation, right? Which, by the way, also just happens to be convex, right? So that's a, that's a different one. It's, it looks like this, but it's not quite the same. In fact, this is, this is the second order approximation of Kelly gambling in the limit of R getting, getting close to one. So if you take the second derivative of the log or whatever, you've, you're gonna recover Markowitz. So yeah, so, so that, that, you can't handle that, but it's a, different, it's a different thing. It's not this. Deep silence. Yeah, I'm sorry. I 
either the uh, uh, covariance matrix or the return. You make some pretty ad hoc choices. You just want it to be in a box, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, the returns are somewhat expected to f have this particular covariance, so it feels like it should dictate an ellipsoid around which you should relax. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you make some trade-off between simplicity and you know maybe sticking to the model. Did you right. try things in between and it was not worth it? How to? Yeah, how no, do you, you can you can do that as well. Uh, so you could actually. You could say, I just estimated my mean, my mean and my covariance, and then you could have, you get fancy, and the mean could have a confidence ellipsoid, and the, you'd have some Wishart distribution on the covariances. So you can do that. Um, the, mean, the ellipsoid thing you can just handle directly. Um, so, and then how you would actually handle that is um, by backtesting. <laughs> like, if you and I had an argument, should it, be uncert should it be box uncertainty or ellipsoid? We'd handle it by backtesting. Oh, um, how do you handle the fact that, you know, in multi-period optimization, forecasts, the errors on the forecast further away are typically much bigger than for a single period, yet you're mm -hmm. assuming that the risk stays the same? Right. So you, uh, you actually can do that. Um, actually, the, the forecasts way out are going to make much less, I mean, they're not going to affect that much. I mean, they're going to affect it if you say, what's going to happen tomorrow? And you'd say, I don't know. But what's going to happen in five days? You think it's going to go up? Then it actually would, would affect it. And actually, there's scale, I mean, there's scale parameters in there that will just fix that. So that, that, that actually is not a, not a problem. If you want to, you could put a discount factor in. I mean, that's fine, traditional. But uh, that can be taken care of. And so I have a question about, uh, can you explain a little, a little bit why multi-period is better than a single period? Oh, um, actually, I don't think I said that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, just just uh, intu intuitively why it, it's, it's an improvement or? Um, oh, it need not be. If you set hyperparameters wrong, uh, it could be worse. Um, actually, the nice thing about multi-period is that certain things, if, 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 you ha if you know stuff that's coming up, like, you know some event is coming up and volatility is going to go up, then you can handle that like very easily with multi-period uh, stuff. If, if you, if you want to, say, get out of a fund or get in, then multi-period is actually wor works better than single period. Um, by the way, not dramatically so. So, I mean, you know, we do control and we'd like it to, I'd, we'd, I'd like to be able to say, oh, yeah, it's always better. It's, it need not be. It, it basically, it's the thing that instead of being myopic, it actually, it, it looks into the future using your forecast and things like that, so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you allow uh, derivatives to be purchased as securities here? And if not, what do you do about ETFs since you're working with BlackRock? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so actually one assumption here is that all the returns are, are linear, uh, right? So, so, so that's, uh, that's, that's, then you get into a different regime. So no ETFs? Oh no, you can do that here. Sure, but don't you have embedded optionality in how they're constructed? Don't you have embedded optionality in the construction of ETFs? Uh, you you do, but for example, you could you could apply this directly. You could throw in some ETFs. Actually, what then your um, your holding cost if you're if you're short is uh, is is actually negative. So if you short an ETF, you actually get paid, right? So yeah, you, you can you can. I mean, so a simple simple versions of that you can handle here. Weird options and stuff like that. Then then basically nonlinear payoffs. You cannot handle this way. And you're, you're back to the Kelly case or something. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Good. I think uh, 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 Deva Wright has some closing remarks for everyone. <laughs> I guess the only closing remark is, well, I hope you guys all enjoyed the day today. Um, I look forward to seeing uh, uh, many of you and a lot more next year. Thank you. <laughs>